All right, so um, the first thing that I will tell you is that, and it's actually the first piece of advice that King gives there, is to read a lot. Now, for those of you that you know are out reading your articles and stuff, um, you're probably thinking that's what he means by read a lot. And to some extent it is. You know, the more familiar you become with the topics that you've got, um, you know, with the themes that you've got there, with the things people are writing about in your field, the easier it will be to write. Um, you know, the more... The folks that I find struggle the most are the folks that are least familiar with their literature. You know, so the more you know about the articles and the, the, the chapters and stuff that you've pulled already, the easier this process is going to be. The other thing that I will tell you is that the other thing King talks about um, is not just to read folks that are writing in your field, so not so that you just gain knowledge of the field, but just to read good writing in general. You know, so find folks, particularly since you're doing an academic piece now, find academics that you feel write well. You, know, you guys have done X number of university courses in your careers up to this point. Um, at this stage, I'm willing to bet that at least a quarter of them, possibly even as many as a third of them, have been in the field of education. You've probably come across some very well-written things in previous courses. You've probably come across some not-so-well-written things, and that's probably the majority of what you've had. Um, you know, but there are going to be that scatter piece here and there from your previous educational studies that you've read, and it was a real pleasure to read that. Pull that up again. What was it about it that made it easy to read, that made it interesting to you, that made it, you know, a pleasure to read? Um, you know, because that is going to help you start to develop your own style as an academic author. The other thing that I often do is I actually read a lot about writing itself. Um, you know, so I have a lot of books about how to be a good writer. Um, one of the ones that I will recommend uh, from an academic perspective that I think is quite good, um, and if I remember correctly, relatively cheap as well, is this Professor is Writer. Um, it's going to be on, the cover will be on one of the slides in here, so, um, and the slides are on Blackboard now, so you can just get it out of there. Uh, but this is that Robert Boyce guy that I was talking about a couple of weeks ago, the guy who writes about, um, essentially, guys, folks who are proficient academic writers. Um, so, you know, what makes a more proficient writer? So he researches, his area of research is actually academics who write and, you know, how they write a lot compared to a little. Another one that I will read, just or I will recommend, just because I think it's a pleasure about to read, um, and it's, you know, it's nice, uh, this Anne Lamont, and again, this is going to be in the presentation as well, a uh, book called Bird by Bird, Some Instructions on Writing in Life. Um, she's talking about um, fiction writing as opposed to academic writing, but there's a lot of stuff in there that I think is quite good. Um, and then one that I actually stumbled across this summer as uh, I was, my niece was down, or my wife's niece was down visiting, I guess she's my niece too now, um, was down visiting, um, and she is an English uh, major, well she's actually in speech therapy now in her doctoral program, but her undergrad was in English, so she's a bit of a, a, a writing person, so we went to all these dead authors' homes, um, you know, which is something I never would have done unless she was here. But one of them was Ralph, uh, Emer or Ralph Waldo Emerson, and one of the books he had was this First We Read, Then We Write, uh, which I've actually, it's quite nice. I've read it a couple of times now since I got it in, she was here, I think, July sometime. Um, maybe it was June. But it's not a bad one, and I think all three of them are relatively cheap. So first, and I'll just go through these a little quickly, there are a lot of reasons why you can't write, or a lot of things that will stop you from writing as you're going through. Um, you know, here are some of the ones that the literature says you'll come across. Here are some more that often show up. The reason I put these up here is because identifying what's stopping you from writing is one of the first steps in overcoming whatever that particular block happens to be. You know, just sitting there and thinking, you know, looking at a blank screen, and it's not as bad now, but back in the old days with DOS where the actual cursor used to blink at you, <laughs> at least now it's one solid kind of thing, uh, you know, but that blinking kind of thing was a, a taunting um, way of looking at it. And, 
I know I started my academic writing career back in the DOS days, so, um, you know, but identifying what's stopping us from writing allows us to start to tackle getting over that. Um, looking at some strategies for overcoming these, and a lot of these are going to be pulled out of various sources. Um, this actually is a list that I got from one of my own faculty members, uh, Mike Hannafin at the University of Georgia. I won't go through all of these um, as I'm going. I will pick out a couple of them. Some of them are ones that uh, unfortunately you probably can't avoid. Like for example, number one, your thesis is you know, a major piece of scholarly work. Um, it's probably your first major piece of scholarly work. Um, in an ideal setting, and you know, one of the reasons why we do this over three courses and we require you to you know, hand in pieces along the way as opposed to, you know, say, a doctoral dissertation where you register for your dissertation credits and you submit a 200-page dissertation. You don't submit chapter two like four times to your instructor before you know, they do. Um, you know, so we try to sequence it out a little bit. Number two, I will underscore, uh, you know, for those of you, particularly those of you in the cohort that, you know, have taken this a semester early, it's a little bit less of a complete shift in your life, um, you know, but you still have 690 next semester while you're taking two courses, while you're doing the internship. Um, even for those of you that, you know, this is the only course you're taking for the next three semesters, um, you know, it's still a significant investment in time. Um, you have to recognize the fact that, you know, it is going to involve a significant chunk of your life for the period of time that you're in it and say, you know, I'm going to, you know, I've signed up for this. I'm going to have to swallow that in order to, you know, be successful in this. And, um, you know, and as, however unpleasant that may be, um, you know, there's no point in trying to fight it, um, getting stressed out about it, um, you know, because that's only going to create more delays and more barriers, which will end up creating more work on the other side. Number five is one I will underscore as well. You know, I will be perfectly honest with you and say that as you are going through this process, for the most part, at least the specific topics that you are writing on, you will be much more expert about them than what I am. You know, unless you're writing about K-12 online and blended learning, you will know the content of your topic a lot better than what I do. How to express that, how to um, communicate that, how to design a study to get at some of that. There will be times when you will not know what, you know, where I should go next kind of thing. Instead of sitting there spinning your wheels trying to figure out where you should go next, that's the time when you want to reach out for help. You know, when you are, you know, don't wait and waste time and struggle and, you know, because getting back to number two, it's a significant amount of time. You know, the more time you spin your wheels, the more time you're adding to your particular journey. Um, you know, so don't wait too long to get help. Um, let's see. A couple of things off of this one that I, I want to stress. Um, that idea of writing through things, you know, there will be times when you're having difficulty saying what it is that you want to say. Don't think that what you type into your computer when you sit down to work on this particular section needs to be the finished polished product. Um, you know, fiction writers will often call it free writing, where basically you just sit down and start writing about the topic that you're focused upon and eventually something coherent, something that makes sense, something that's usable will flow out. From an academic perspective, what tends to happen is that you get your ideas down. They might not be perfect. They might not flow the way you want. But once they're all down, it's a lot easier to edit them than it is to essentially sit there for a half hour and try to keep coming up with the perfect prose on the first effort. Right? So right through the barriers that you're having, right through you know, that process of how do I say this the way I want to. 
Um, it will not be uncommon for you to write a page and then turn it into a half a page. Then to write another page and then edit it down to a half a page. And that's actually a great way of going about it because you're actually continuing to make forward progress instead of sitting there trying to figure out, okay, you know, I've got this sentence half written, but I don't quite know how to finish it, so I'm going to sit here and run through all kinds of different calculations and, and manciations in my mind trying to figure out how to finish this sentence in a perfect way. Um, I will point out number eight as an example. Um, when you send things to me for editing, it's always a useful idea to get a spouse or a colleague to read through it first. If they can't understand what you're saying, chant, you know, because most of you are writing about a topic that is of interest to you in your own personal or professional settings, which means that your spouse has probably heard you complain about it or at least talk about it <laughs> at some point in time. Your colleagues are likely experiencing similar things uh, because that's, you know, they're going through the same thing you're going through, which is why you're interested in the first place. If they don't know what you're talking about, there's no way I'm going to know what you're talking about. All right? So it's always a good idea before you send something off to me or to someone. Uh, you know, if you guys start setting up writing groups, which is actually another good, or writing buddies, which is another good strategy. Um, it's always good to have someone who's familiar with your context or what it is you're doing to look at it first before you send it to your writing buddy or before you send it to me. If you don't have somebody that you can do that with, try reading it out loud. You know, if you can read it out loud and it actually makes sense to you, uh, because one of the things we know from research is that when you read something in your mind, you add and eliminate words to make it make sense to you. When you read it out loud, those words come out. And if they don't quite sound right, you know right away that they don't quite sound right. One of the things that we try to do in this course, and for that matter in 690 and 691, is try to put in these structured deadlines to keep you moving forward. Um, it's always a good idea for you guys to also set your own intermediate deadlines and try to stick to those. Um, you know, I mean, things will always possibly come up that, you know, or things just take a little bit longer than what you initially planned. Um, you know, but start to actually put together a writing calendar. You know, I'm going to have X number of pages done by this date, or I'm going to have, you know, once you get your outline put together, I'm going to have this section done by this date. You know, so that way you've got some way of being accountable to yourself as you're going through. Um, understand the limitations of yourself as a writer as well. Um, you know, one of the things, and you'll see in Blackboard, I've got a document that I've put up there that's called a writing plan. Um, essentially what it is is something I use with doctoral students, so it's not as applicable to you because, uh, but it basically looks at, I think there's 13 different writing situations in there. Um, so there are like different times a day for different amounts of time in different settings, and I've tried to essentially put the combinations together in as many different possible combinations as I can. And what I always challenge doctoral students when I work with them is I say, take 13 weeks. Do each of these things for one week. Record how much you wrote and how much of it was usable at the end of each week. And then at the end of 13 weeks, you'll figure out, you know, in which, which context or contexts you were most successful in writing. Now, some of them, because you guys are all teachers or administrators or at least all have day jobs, um, some of you have families and kids and other responsibilities. Some of them you just won't be able to do, you know, some of the situations. But look at the different combinations that are in there. See which ones are ones that you can explore with. And then as you're starting to write over the next few weeks, try some of them out. You know, figure out under which situations you write best. You know, so understand yourself as a researcher, which also means understanding your limitations as a researcher. Um, you know, if you find out very quickly that, you know, I'm good for about an hour, but after an hour I just start to daydream and, you know, then fine. Carve out a bunch of hours as opposed to this three-hour block that you're going to do. Number 17, I think, is particularly appropriate. <laughs> Uh, 
um, as is, for that matter, 18, 19, and 20. You know, there are... The 18, I think, is, is a particularly useful one because... And I've even had this, this question come up already this semester. You know, I feel like I need more articles on X, or I need more literature about X. I can guarantee you there is always some other piece of literature that you could find that would be relevant to your particular literature review. If you wait to write until you've got them all, you will never write. Use writing to identify the areas in which you need more literature. And if you're able to write a complete section and you're comfortable with the fact that there are no single citation paragraphs that are in there, that you've supported all of your themes with multiple you know, data, you know, data from multiple pieces of literature, then if you do have to go back in the literature, you know you don't need to look for anything about X because you've already got that taken care of. You know, use the areas in which you still feel that you don't have enough literature about this, or as you're reading through in this particular section, two of the three paragraphs are single citation paragraphs, so I need something else that supports the point that this person here is making. You know, use that as a way of directing your search as opposed to waiting until you've got everything that you need before you start writing. Um, I mentioned Boyce at the beginning. Uh, in all honesty, of all of the resources I've got up here, and for those that are viewing this online, there's about a dozen books up there. This is probably, I think, the most useful one. If I was going to spend any money buying any book about writing, this is the book that I would buy, um, in all honesty. There are a couple of things that he talks about in here, um, and I'll go through these a little bit quickly. Most of them you've seen before, a couple of them that um, are new. I've told you about the importance of taking time and outlining and planning out what you want to say. That's what he's talking about there, number one. Um, you know, don't just start writing aimlessly. Um, most of the things I write, I have an outline developed to the point that every single thing on my outline represents roughly one paragraph of text. So I know exactly what I need to say in this paragraph, at least from a thematic perspective or a topic perspective. Um, one of the things that he has found from the research is that writing daily, and actually to be very specific, five out of seven days a week, uh, tends to be when most academics are most productive and writing in short periods of time. Um, no less than a half hour, no more than 90 minutes. So essentially writing for 30 minutes a day, every day, is actually the way in which most people are most productive. The logic behind that is that if you write in large chunks of time, particularly that are spaced out, you spend a fair amount of time trying to figure out where you were and where you were going. Um, you know, whereas if you're writing on a frequent basis, it's very easy to remember where I was yesterday morning if I'm writing again this morning. Um, so one of the things, particularly for teachers, that I often recommend, um, you know, if you have the opportunity of waking up a half hour before your kids and before everyone else, um, you know, and writing and then starting about your day, getting in the shower and all the other stuff you normally do, that's a good time. Or taking a half hour after everyone has gone to bed and working that. Um, and again, it's five out of seven days is what the research says. So not necessarily every day, five out of seven days. You know, so if you think about it, um, and one of the other things he finds is actually consistent time tends to help, although one of the things I'd tell you is that I'd play around with that. Um, you know, it may work for, while it works for most academics, it may not work for you. Um, you know, but if that is, you know, one of the conditions under which you work best, finding that out pretty soon is, is useful. Um, we talked about that idea of identifying things that are stopping you from writing, um, and that's actually a lot of what you see on this particular page. Um, that number nine, I think, is actually quite useful. By critics, they mean reviewers. You know, so finding a writing buddy, submitting things to me for feedback, Oftentimes, I'm going to tell you, or your colleague is going to tell you, you know, you need to say more about this, or I don't quite understand what you mean about this, so can you explain it a little bit better? Or, as we did tonight in the samples, there needs to be a transition sentence right here. Right? That's the kind of thing that your reviewers will tell you, so they'll do a lot of the work for you as you're going through. Um, 
And for the folks watching on the recording, I forgot to advance that slide, so you're just getting all of the commentary for what I was just talking about there now. So it was number nine I was talking about. Um, King's book on writing. If I were to buy two books from the list that I've got there, this would actually be the second one. Um, I'm not actually a fan of his work. I don't think I've read any of his books. I know I've never seen any of his movies. Um, I just don't like that genre. But this book on writing is, is wonderful. I've read it probably a half a dozen times. Um, it's a very interesting one. I sort of give you the outline of it here. Um, the first, he basically, it's mostly out of, the first and third sections are autobiographical in nature. Um, in the first section, he talks about essentially what he went through as a beginning <coughs> writer in that first novel that he had. Um, then he actually spends a full section just on talking about tips about writing, which the ten that you've got there come from. And then the third section, he basically talks about, you know, how he came back after he was struck by the, the car that time and essentially started to write again and the specific struggles that he went through becoming an author again at that point. Um, but a really useful piece of advice. I won't go through these uh, because the handout that I've given you uh, does a pretty good job and actually pulls quotes out from the book. Um, all of these here are actually quotes from the book as well. Um, I word them a slightly differently than uh, what he does, and you can see them from the handouts that are posted online or from the one I just gave you in class. One of the quotes that he has in the book um, that I particularly like, just because you write it, and even if you spent lots of time doing it, doesn't necessarily mean that it should end up in your final product. You know, if you've got something that as you're writing through you know is bad, um, you know it's poorly written, you know you struggled to write it, uh, chances are you might want to leave that out. You know, Not everything that you put to paper needs to end up in the final product. Um, the other book that I mentioned up front that I think is quite book is this, or quite good, sorry, is this one by Anne Lamont, um, Bird by Bird, Some Instructions on Writing and Life. And if you read the story that I've got on the screen there, that's essentially the basis of the book. Um, so it's roughly 200 words about or 200 pages story about writing that really stem from this kind of story and this is the nature of how she does all of the you know the whole book is like this so it's all about you know her personal stories and how she relates that back to writing and you know I think that this is um, quite nice and in all honesty it's the same kind of advice I'd give to you you know as you put together that outline and you've got those detailed topics listed and stuff like that pick one Work your way through that one. Then pick another one. It doesn't necessarily have to be the one that nat naturally follows that particular one. Just pick the next one that you're interested in and work your way through it. You know, chunk this up as much as you possibly can. Um, this relates to that um, handout that you've got online, and I'll also post two more uh, that come from Boyce's book on spontaneous and generative writing. There are two types of things there. When I do this presentation over a longer period of time, I often have people actually go through these two activities. Um, so, and I go through and describe what they are here. Um, I would also try these two things, so spontaneous and generative writing, um, as you're going through and doing your own process. So in addition to those 13 weeks that I've got in the writing plan, take a look at those four slides there, the one on spontaneous and the three on generative writing, and Try both of those. See if either of those help you in your writing process. Uh, there are two strategies, research-based strategies that Boyce puts forward in his book. Um, you know, so they're worth giving a shot to as you're doing your own writing. 